Also willkommen zum nächsten Teil. Ich habe Ihnen ja versprochen, es geht Schlag auf Schlag und wir begrüßen jetzt gleich einen Mann, dessen Romane in 20 Sprachen übersetzt wurden und dessen Gesamtauflage die Millionengrenze längst überschritten hat. Peter Robinson. Kurz ein paar Sätze zu seiner Biografie. Er wurde in Yorkshire geboren, machte seinen Bachelor in englischer Literatur an der Universität Leeds und ging dann nach Kanada. Dort machte er seinen Magister in Englisch und in kreativem Schreiben an der Universität Windsor. Anschließend promovierte er in Toronto und unterrichtete an verschiedenen Colleges. Auch jetzt ist er noch ab und zu an der Universität von Toronto aktiv. Der große Wendepunkt in seinem Leben war das Jahr 1987. Da schrieb er seinen ersten Roman, Gallows You, bei uns in Deutschland veröffentlicht unter dem Titel Augen im Dunkeln. Das war dann auch schon der erste Fall für Alan Banks, seinen Serienermittler. Darauf folgten 14 weitere sehr erfolgreiche Alan Banks Romane. Darüber hinaus hat Peter Robinson aber auch zahlreiche Kurzgeschichten geschrieben, für die er genauso wie für seine Romane mit zahlreichen Preisen überhäuft und ausgezeichnet wurde. Der aktuelle Roman bis hier, wir werden natürlich auch aus ihm hören, eine seltsame Affäre im Original Strange Affair. So viel zu Peter Robinson und ich freue mich ganz besonders auch ihn hier begrüßen zu dürfen. Welcome to Munich, Peter Robinson. I don't know where you are. Same city, but mm -hmm. you know, different sides of town. Yeah, but there's a regular contact between Canadian writers, or is it just a coincidence in your case? We meet in Munich and, and <laughs> London and Paris sometimes, <laughs> but, but, but very rarely in Toronto. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very funny, isn't it? Because Charles Blunt moved from Canada to New York, and you moved from England to Canada. It's, it's a long time ago, 25 years or? Okay. Yeah, it was in the late 70s, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so why did you move? Um, I, I went there actually for higher education. Um, I, I'd finished my, my BA in England, uh, Leeds University, and I, I wanted to travel, and, and, and they advertised at, at Leeds, they, they had a big poster on the wall, advertising a course in English and creative writing at the University of Windsor, Ontario. And it showed this ivy-covered building, which looked very beautiful and old and stuff. And, 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 and I went there. Uh, Joyce Carol Oates was actually teaching creative writing at the time, and I was one of her students. I'd never heard of it then. This was, you know, the, the late 70s. There is one ivy covered building on campus there, and it is very nice, but the rest of the campus is, is rather ugly. Um, but, you know, I, I wanted to go to North America. I, I thought I would do my year, I would travel around, and go back, get a teaching job in England, and, and stay there. But Margaret Thatcher got in in England. There were no jobs for anybody. It was easier to, to go into a PhD program, teach part time, stay in Canada. I met someone. I got married, and, and you know, it just as as a year went on, as the years went on, I ended up staying maybe more by default than choice. I mean, it wasn't that I either chose deliberately or, or ever rejected Canada, but you know, the years went by, and I thought, well, I'm still here. You know, I mean, it's it looks like I live here. Yeah. You know? And, and you mentioned Maggie Thatcher, but you didn't decide to come back to England when Tony Blair was Prime Minister. It wasn't much difference as far as that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, for me it's very interesting that living in Canada, you began writing about England. So why that? I don't, I mean, people always ask that and I don't see why it would be so strange at all because I, I haven't been in Canada very long um, and I was very nostalgic about it. You know my my home country. I mean, Graham Greene had a saying about you know the first 20 years of a writer's life um, gives him all the experience he needs. The rest is just detail. And then in some ways, that, that that's true. That it, it was what I was writing about was where I'd grown up, where I'd spent my life. But being in Canada, I think, gave me a detached view of England, a more objective view of England, but also tinged with, with, with a little nostalgia, you know, a, a little, little homesickness. So it was very different from the kind of writing that people who lived there all the time were doing, or for example some of the Americans who set their books in England were doing. So it, it just, I, I think, 
made my, my, my get myself a slightly different quality from, from everybody else's. Let's talk a little bit about, about your main figure, Alan Banks. Vielleicht für Sie noch kurz die Information, falls Sie Alan Banks nicht kennen. 56 Jahre alt, Detective Chief Inspector der Abteilung Kapitalverbrechen, Zentrale der Western Area in Eastvale, North Yorkshire. Er war schon mal in Kanada bei dem einen oder anderen Fall, aber einen richtigen Kanada-Fall von Alan Banks gab es nicht. Will there ever be a whole Alan Banks case in Canada? Uh, no. Uh, it, it, will, it will be very difficult. Um, I, there, there was an earlier novel uh, called The Hanging Valley in English. I'm not sure if it's been translated. It was, it was my fourth novel. Uh, and about a third of that book takes place in Toronto, where Banks comes to Toronto to look for an English expatriate. So he goes to all the uh, English pubs in Toronto, which is the first place you would look for an English expatriate uh, in any country in the world, um, especially someone from Yorkshire. Uh, so, uh, it was a lot of, the research was, was a lot of fun. It was hard on the liver, but you know, I, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, and that was a good excuse you know, to, to, to have him in Canada. But it would be very difficult to find an excuse to have him be there for a whole novel. And, and I think these novels where the detective is on holiday and stumbles across a corpse in Torre Molinos or somewhere, never work, you know. Uh, and I always avoid them, and I'm sure most readers do. And, and it's great for the writer to have a tax write-off, you know, uh, for the holiday. Um, but it's, it's, it, I'm not going to do one of those novels. I mean, Banks does spend time away from Yorkshire, and in quite a lot of books, uh, he spends some time in London. Uh, often working on his own, and it, certainly in Strange Affair, uh, most of the book he spends in London almost working as a private detective, because he is not um, officially in an investigation. <coughs> um, but, but, but he's very strongly tied to Yorkshire. Yeah. You mentioned Strange Affair, if it's okay for you, we can start with the reading. Sure, yeah, yeah. Okay. and, and um, I'm, I'm, rather than reading from the middle, actually yeah. reading the opening scene. Yeah. Okay. Vielleicht für Sie die Information, diesmal beginnen wir wirklich am Anfang und der Roman, ein seltsamer Erfinder, beginnt auch mit einer sehr, sehr verhängnisvollen Autofahrt. Alles weitere jetzt von Peter Robinson selbst. Um, the, the, just a, a brief explanation, that there are two strands in this book and, and one is a murder um, that occurs in Yorkshire that, that Annie Cabot is investigating and the other is, is Banks uh, looking into problem with his brother, which you'll hear about a little later. So the, 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 scene, the opening scene I'm going to read introduces what, what becomes the, the, the Yorkshire strand of the mystery. Was she being followed? It was hard to tell at that time of night on the motorway. There's plenty of traffic, lorries for the most part, people driving home from the pub just a little too carefully, red BMWs coasting up the fast lane doing a hundred or more businessmen in a hurry to get home from late meetings. She was beyond Newport Pagnell now and the muggy night air blurred the red taillights of the cars ahead and the oncoming headlights across the road. She began to feel nervous as she checked her rearview mirror and saw that the car was still behind her. She pulled over to the inside lane and slowed down. The car, a dark Mondeo, overtook her. It was too dark to glimpse faces, but she thought there was just one person in the front and another in the back. It didn't have a taxi light on top, so she guessed it was probably a chauffeured car and stopped worrying. Some rich git being ferried to a nightclub in Leeds, most likely. She overtook the Monday or a little farther up the motorway and did, didn't give it a second glance. The late night radio was playing old blue eyes singing summer wind. Her kind of music, no matter how old fashioned people told her it was. Talent and good music never went out of style as far as she was concerned. When she got to the Watford Gap services, she realised she felt tired and hungry, and she still had a long way to go, so she decided to stop for a short break. She didn't even notice the Mondeo pulling two cars behind her. A few seedy-looking people hung around the entrance. A couple of kids who didn't look old enough to drive stood smoking, playing the machines, giving her the eye as she walked past, staring at her breasts. She went first to the ladies, then to the cafe, where she bought a ham and tomato sandwich and sat alone to eat, washing it down with a Diet Coke. At the table opposite, a man with a long face and dandruff on the collar of his dark suit jacket 
gave her the eye over the top of his glasses, pretending to read his newspaper and eat a sausage roll. Was he just a garden variety pervert, or was there something more sinister in his interests, she wondered. In the end, she decided he was just a perv. Sometimes it seems as if the world was full of them. She could hardly walk down the street or go for a drink on her own without some sub pillar who thought it was God's gift eyeing her up, like the kids hanging around the entrance or coming over and laying a line of chat on her. Still, she told herself, what else could you expect at this time of night in a motorway service station? A couple of other men came in and went to the counter for coffee to go, but they didn't give her a second glance. She finished half the sandwich, dumped the rest and got a travel mug filled with coffee. When she walked back to her car, she made sure there were people around, a family with two young kids up way past their bedtime, noisy and hyperactive and that no one was following her. The tank was only a quarter full, so she filled it up at the petrol station, using her credit card right there at the pump. The perv from the cafe pulled up at the pump opposite and stared at her as he put the nozzle in his tank. She ignored him. She could see the night manager in his office watching through the window, and that made her feel more secure. Tank full, she turned down the slip road and eased in between two juggernauts. It was hot in the car, so she opened both windows and enjoyed the play of the breeze it created. It helped keep her awake, along with the hot black coffee. The clock on the dashboard read 12.53 a.m., only about two or three hours to go. Then she would be safe. Nummer war erstmal Pause. Penny ging durchs Publikum. Es teilte sich vor ihr wie das Rote Meer. Lächelnd grüßte sie nach rechts und links. Dann stellte sie sich neben Banks an die Theke. Sie zündete sich eine Zigarette an, sog den Rauch ein, formte die Lippen zu einem Kreis und blies Banks Kringel ins Gesicht. Das waren drei tolle Stücke, sagte er. Danke, sie sah ihn nicht an. Ein Gin Tonic bitte, Kath, bestellte sie bei dem Mädchen hinter der Theke. Aber einen großen. Banks hörte ihrem knappen Tonfall an, dass sie ihn für einen Fan hielt, vielleicht sogar für einen Spinner oder Stalker. Sobald sie ihr Getränk bekam, würde sie verschwinden. Kennen Sie mich nicht mehr? fragte er. Seufzend wandte sie sich zu ihm, um ihn endgültig eine Abfuhr zu erteilen. Dann schien es ihr langsam zu dämmern. Sie wurde unsicher, schämte sich und wusste nicht, was sie sagen sollte. Ach, so... Detective Inspector Berg, nicht? brachte sie schließlich hervor. Oh, sie, oder sind Sie befördert worden? Leider nicht, entgegnete er. Ich heiße Banks, aber Ellen ist auch okay. Ist schon lange her. Ja. Penny hielt ihm ihren Chip Tonic entgegen und stieß vorsichtig mit seinem Bierglas an. Slancher. Slancher wieder der. Ich wusste gar nicht, dass Sie wieder in Hamburg sind. Tja, für mich hat leider keiner die Werbetrommel gerührt. Banks sah sich im schwach beleuchteten Raum um. Wieso? Sie scheinen doch jede Menge treuer Fans zu haben. Mund zu Mund Propaganda. Aber stimmt, ich wohne wieder in einem alten Cottage. Und was führt sie hier? Ich habe im Vorbeigehen die Musik gehört, erklärte Banks. Und ihre Stimme erkannt. Was haben Sie so gemacht in letzter Zeit? Eine Spur Misstrauen schlich sich in Pennys Blick. Das wäre eine ziemlich lange Geschichte. Und ich weiß nicht, ob Sie das überhaupt etwas angeht. Sie können es mir ja mal bei einem Essen erzählen. Penny runzelte die Stirn, zog die Augenbrauen zusammen und sah ihn mit ihren stechend blauen Augen durchdringend an. Dann schüttelte sie kurz den Kopf. Das kann ich auf gar keinen Fall, sagte sie leise. Warum nicht? Das ist doch nur eine Einladung zum Essen. Sie wich vor ihm zurück. Ich kann's einfach nicht, das ist alles. Wie können Sie überhaupt so etwas vorschlagen? Hören Sie, falls Sie Angst haben, mit einem verheirateten Mann gesehen zu werden, das ist schon seit ein paar Jahren vorbei, ich bin geschieden. Penny sah ihn an, als habe er nicht den blassesten Schimmer, schüttelte wieder den Kopf und verschwand in der Menge. Banks war wie vor den Kopf gestoßen, das verstand er nicht. Was hatte ihr völlig entsetzter Gesichtsausdruck zu bedeuten? So abstoßend war er doch auch wieder nicht. Eine simple Einladung. Was hatte diese Frau bloß? Banks leerte sein Bierglas und steuerte auf die Tür zu. Penny kehrte auf die Bühne zurück. 
Er fing ihren Blick quer durch den vollen Raum auf. Sie wirkte leicht aus der Bahn geworfen. Sein Vorschlag hatte sie offenbar völlig verwirrt. Na, wenigstens machte sie nicht mehr so ein entsetztes Gesicht, dachte er, und verließ mit rotem Kopf das Lokal. Well, I'm probably very foolish to answer that question. Um, I'm very curious, I know. Well, Roy is, is, is an interesting guy. Um, I wouldn't say that, 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 that he's exactly 100% on the right side of the law, but I would also wouldn't call him a, a really bad guy. And, and, and I think that a lot of the book being partly about their relationship, you know, obviously it's clear that he and Banks uh, don't get on, Banks doesn't trust him, and Roy's a bit of a high flyer, and, and, and that's, that's evident. Um, is, is Banks finding out where Roy draws his moral lines, and, and you know, it, it does shock and surprise him in some ways, but uh, I, you know, don't think that he's, don't be convinced he's quite as bad as you might think he is. He's in over his head, really. Talking about moral, um, Banks himself, um, would you call him a typical policeman? Because this is his 15th case, and he's always very sad and angry about crime. He's not cynical. Um, he can be cynical, but you're right. I mean, on, on, on the whole, uh, I've, I've written maybe three more since then, and he's, he's still not cynical. He may be in the next one after what happened to him in the last one, but uh, uh, no, he, he sort of manages to maintain the, the sort of battered faith in humanity. And I mean, in that sense, he's like one of the 30s for his American private eyes, you know, like Philip Marlowe or somebody. I mean, Raymond Chandler was one of my first influences, but it was a style that would never influence me. I could never try or want to try and write like Chandler. Uh, in an English detective story. But I think some of the influence comes into the character in some way, like being um, a bit of a romantic, you know, a little cynical on the surface, but, but, but having underneath it all the, the, this kind of strong belief in the common man and, and in, in good, really. I mean, Banks is sort of an everyman who, who does a, a superman's job. And Banks, Banks is an absolute music fanatic. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it comes from me a lot. It would be very hard to, for me to write enthusiastically about music that I don't like. Um, very difficult. So, uh, uh, obviously, the, the, the beginning of this book is in a folk club, so a lot of it's written. And the title comes from a Richard Thompson song that was mentioned uh, in, in the scene, uh, The Strange Affair. It's a very, very, very sad song about friends passing family uh, passing. Uh, so, so, no, I mean, it's, it's an enduring interest in, in, in all the Banks books, I think, is, is, is what he's going to be listening to next. And, and it can, he's, he's got very broad taste, so it can vary from folk to chamber music, opera, rock and roll, you know, punk, even. You know, yeah. He likes Clash. And we so just heard he, he misses his CDs and he's got an iPhone. Uh, he, he, has an iPod, he has an iPod, which actually he, he, he gets from his brother. Um, yes, it, 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 one of the things about writing a, a long series with one character uh, is, is that the thing, and, and, and he actually ages in more or less real time. He changes, he develops, he responds to what happens to him in life. And it's very difficult to, to, to start a book like this without referring to what's happened in previous books. So you basically, at the beginning of this, have to give away the end of the last book about the fire in which he lost his CD collection. Uh, and, and in the one after this, of course, I have to give away the end of this one as what, what happened with his brother and everything. I'm not going to give it away now, but, but if you read, I mean, it's out in English. You don't wait for the German translation. You could read it. Uh, so it, it's, so I mean, it means that, and, and it's interesting to me, it means that I'm not really concerned about who done it. I mean, You know, that's not, it's a part of it, and you know, there's always a little bit of a puzzle as it goes along. But I'm far more interested in why people do the things they do, and what the consequences are, and how they deal with the consequences, rather than the, this little puzzle of who was it who did it. I don't know myself till I'm about three quarters of the way through writing the book. And this case, Family Affair, is not only a family case. You also mention elements like prostitution, arms trade, and human trafficking. 
So is this important too to integrate these things? Yeah, I mean, I, I, like, like a book comes together from a lot of ideas, but, but usually for me there are maybe a couple of themes, and, and, and of course it's the relationship with the brother is one thing that, that I, I touched upon in previous books but never developed. And, and the other thing was a little bit more topical, you know, political even. Um, and at the time that I wrote this, it was published in English in, in, in 2005, which means I wrote it in 2003, 4. Um, the whole question of, of, of sort of people trafficking, especially the sex trade from Eastern Europe into Germany, Italy, France, England, North America, uh, wasn't quite as, as big um, a media thing as it is now. I mean, since then, they've, they've been made for TV movies, documentaries, movies, but at that time there was nothing. But there's a Canadian journalist called uh, Victor Malarak who wrote a book uh, called The Natasha's, uh, which had a, a strong, I mentioned him in the, in the acknowledgements here, and I, and I met him and talked to him. And he'd spent time talking to the UN peacekeepers um, in, in, in the Balkans, Kosovo, places like that. And he discovered a lot of stories about some of the nasty stuff that was going on there in, in the sort of sex trade, uh, people trafficking business. So, so, so that came into it. And as, as I say, at the time it, it was not all over the place, but since then it's, it's become far more commonplace to hear about that. So, so that, that was the extra element, yeah. I would like to talk about this very much longer, but I'm, again, I'm afraid time is running out now. So this was the second part. Thank you very much, Peter Robinson, for this. Thank you.